any form of specific treatment that we need to be um, that that can be initiated. And sometimes we follow people over time looking for change. So with treatment of symptoms or conditions, um, are we seeing change over time? Are people getting better? Are they getting worse? Or are they staying the same? And that's where the reevaluation over time can help us to plot that out and look at, um, are we seeing any systematic um, change over time? That sometimes that can help clarify diagnosis as well. Now, it's nice when everything lines up, but the truth is, is that sometimes it doesn't. And we do have some discordant um, objective and subjective findings or symptoms um, as part of this evaluation process. This is really important that we don't ignore this and that we really try to understand why maybe our results are different than what um, the individual is presenting with or what their experience is. And there's a variety of reasons why that can be. And it can really go in both directions. So for example, in the um, instance of uh, individuals with dementia or severe traumatic brain injury, frontal lobe injuries, that um, in cases where the insight may be poor, we sometimes will see much more difficulty on testing than the individual is aware of. Um, so that's one example of where we can see some discordant types of uh, reporting and symptoms. On the other hand, there are times where our testing may show uh, relatively preserved uh, functioning in some or all abilities that may be discordant with what the experience is of the individual. And it's important to, to look at what may be the factors that explain that, especially for as a professional, as well as for individuals, making sure that we are not overly relying on our beliefs about a certain condition or what may be going on um, and only focusing on the evidence for that and ignoring other um, evidence or facts or uh, data that we have that may suggest a different explanation. Um, so we wanna be sure that we're not falling into some type of confirmation balance, but bias, but that we're looking really back to that hypothesis testing to understand how can we under, how can we uh, make sense of those discordant findings. And it's not that unusual. In fact, in some um, disorders, um, we see this quite frequently, some that are very well understood and defined and others that may not be quite as well understood or defined. So for example, let me just start with multiple sclerosis, a very um, well understood neurological disorder that has a clear mechanism uh, of action in terms of what, why individuals experience a variety of um, physical, psychological, and cognitive symptoms. But it's not that uncommon that we may see individuals that have a lot of cognitive complaints, yet their cognitive testing uh, may be mild and in some cases, mostly normal. And we can understand that a couple of different ways. For example, in multiple sclerosis, fatigue is a major um, symptom. In fact, it's the most debilitating symptom in some individuals. And it may be that they can, in, they can kind of gather up the energy to perform well during the evaluation, but it requires a lot more effort. So by the end of the evaluation, they may be um, extremely fatigued and even have difficulty thinking and functioning for a day or two afterwards, um, but they were able to do okay in that structured environment where they kind of garnered the energy to do well in that evaluation. Um, there may be other factors um, that related to the disease process that can interfere with different aspects of cognition that we need to um, be aware of. For example, um, individuals may have problems with attention um, that they're not quite aware of, but they influence how somebody performs on memory measures and also memory in everyday life. If you can't attend to something and really focus and processing it, process it, you're not gonna be able to remember it at a later time. So uh, that's one reason why we really wanna look at um, in depth all aspects of cognition as part of our evaluation. I have listed here a number of other um, syndromes or disorders that share some symptoms with Havana syndrome um, that uh, we can sometimes see some of these kind of discordant types of findings. And the reasons behind that um, are multifactorial. Sometimes it can be a misattribution of symptoms to something else, again, like fatigue or attention, thinking that um, 
it's memory when it's really something else. But we know that sleep disturbance, um, pain syndromes, um, and psychological um, difficulties can all affect cognitive functioning um, in different ways. And so it's important to look at all of those different parameters to see, is there something that can be do, done to treat those underlying conditions that may result in improvement in some of the cognitive symptoms? And even, even if the psychological difficulties are not causing um, or not the primary cause of what an individual's presentation is, if that's not addressed, um, then we, an individual may start to establish a maladaptive pattern of behavior that can then accentuate or worsen some of the other cognitive um, and behavioral symptoms, even physical symptoms um, that they may be experiencing. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Dr. Cullum to talk about a little bit more some specific examples um, and give you a model for understanding this. Thank you, Dr. Lucritz. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what we know about Havana syndrome from a neuropsychological perspective. Um, I don't really have any relevant disclosures to make. And we're gonna talk about concussion as a potential model, typical recovery versus lingering system, symptom uh, situations, uh, and then uh, what limited research there is uh, from a Havana syndrome perspective. But before I get into that, I, I wanna uh, just uh, say, make a comment about one of the syndromes uh, Dr. Chris just mentioned in terms of a complex clinical phenomena. And the Gulf War syndrome is clearly one terrific example we had a major effort to study this in the 1990s under the leadership of Robert Haley. Uh, ended up uh, finding different subgroups and phenotypes, uh, and uh, it posed a lot of challenges. Uh, there was a lot of controversy, obviously, uh, but through multimodal um, clinical evaluations, uh, biometrics, and other types of assessments, we were able to come up with some subgroups and phenotypes that uh, helped inform our, uh, the state of the science on, on that condition. So we obviously uh, want to do the same thing here. So when, we, when it comes to concussions, no two are ever alike. Um, in diagnosing a concussion, in traditional sense, this is not in the Havana sense, uh, you've got to establish a plausible mechanism of injury, what happened. Uh, does it sound consistent with what we often see in brain injury? And then looking at what are the signs and symptoms of concussion, and then whether or not recovery is typical or atypical. We always have to consider potential confounding factors, as Dr. Lucritz nicely outlined, in terms of uh, comorbidities, other things that may account for some of the symptoms. Um, and we have to keep in mind that when it comes to concussion, it is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, neuroimaging is normal in most cases, and there are no specific biomarkers for diagnosis at this point in time. It is a multimodal assessment required, uh, including clinical exam, symptom reports from patients, uh, detailed clinical interviews, balanced cognitive assessment, uh, maybe vestibular evaluations and so on. And then we look at the pattern of profiles uh, that uh, a patient produces and compare them to other types of conditions that we know more about uh, to see what matches up best. Does this look like what we see, what we tend to see in concussion or is it something different? Now, everyone probably knows that the majority of people who sustain a concussion do tend to recover relatively quickly and quite thoroughly. However, there is a substantial minority, somewhere between five and 20 or 25%, that do report lingering symptoms. This used to be called post-concussion syndrome, but we really find that not a terribly useful uh, moniker in this day and age. So we really talk about those who are suffering from lingering symptoms. The big challenge in this area is to identify really who's though at risk for these lingering symptoms. And we think this is where this may be a reasonable model for Havana. So factors in concussion recovery in general, the initial symptom severity tends to be the most strong predictor of lingering symptoms. So if you've got more symptoms, they're more severe early on after concussion, you're at greater risk of having symptoms that persist. We have found in our own research that initial anxiety symptoms actually help identify um, kids and adolescents and young adults 
uh, who may be uh, at risk for lingering symptoms as well. But then there are a variety of other factors that we have to look at um, when we are looking for the uh, things related to persistent or lingering symptoms. One of the questions we often get is, does the source of injury or the nature or the etiology of the injury matter? So of course, there's a lot of discussion about blunt force uh, concussion where the head strikes something or the body is hit with a uh, significant blow versus blast related concussion. And the jury's a little bit out still on that. There was a nice review done a couple of years back um, talking about the similarities and differences between concussion, traditional concussion, I'll call it, versus blast injury. And our own uh, study as part of our uh, Concussion Texas uh, projects, we looked at uh, survivors from motor vehicle accidents and compared them to uh, sport-related concussion equated for uh, level of injury, age, sex, gender, time since injury, and actually found that the motor vehicle uh, concussion-related folks actually did show higher symptoms and took a little bit longer to recover. So we think that the context of injury may influence symptoms and in recovery as well, but how does that factor into um, Havana research? Oh, well, there's very limited research thus far. There have really only been what I would call a couple of case series studies, uh, to my knowledge, at this point in the literature. Um, Swanson et al. was mentioned uh, earlier in 2018, was one of the first. Uh, they talked about uh, 21 case series, uh, cases reported. They reported cognitive, vestibular, oculomotor, auditory problems, in addition to sleep disturbance and headache. 17 out of the 21 reported persistent cognitive symptoms. These were primarily in the areas of memory, feeling mentally foggy, difficulty concentrating, and just general cognitive slowing, in addition to a fairly high frequency of irritability and anxiety. Combined with the compelling case reports and other testimonials, uh, this really does point to disrupted cognitive functioning in some of these individuals. When we look when we look at neuropsychological data, that is information test scores obtained from those evaluations Dr. Lukritz described, um, these patients did undergo uh, a neuropsychological evaluation that included commonly used measures. Uh, they looked at language, memory, fine motor dexterity, attention, and they were screening for some psychological symptoms as well. Neuropsych evaluation had been performed in 10 of the cases, but they only had results to report at, uh, on six at the time of publication. And unfortunately, they didn't uh, have scores to report. So it's a little bit different, to, difficult to evaluate. However, the authors noted that there was evidence of cognitive impairment and a higher endorsement of depression and medical symptoms than their uh, similarly small control group. So the, these findings were preliminary, but suggestive of cognitive complaints and impairments in some of these individuals. They did a subsequent imaging study as well, the same group, a little bit larger with sample size of 40. And as Dr. DeClave mentioned this morning, they did find some uh, differences in gray and white matter volumes uh, and some uh, DTI, uh, diffusion tensor imaging differences, even some functional connectivity differences. Um, but unfortunately, they did not report any cognitive data or how those data sets might relate to each other. And both of these studies uh, were limited by the clinical nature of the data. That is, um, some uh, were only referred outside for evaluations uh, outside of the institution. Uh, so the investigators were only able to get the information that was uh, obtained by or provided by patients and or those referring uh, those referral sources. Um, there is uh, also, uh, as the Jason report has reported, uh, the NIH is uh, undergoing or, or has authorized a larger study that's underway that is going to include healthy individuals as well as some uh, traumatic brain injury uh, control subjects, which I think will be really, really important to see. The Hoffer study was uh, mentioned uh, earlier as well by Dr. Kutz, uh, and there were 25 uh, symptomatic individuals. 14 of those reported cognitive symptoms and also underwent neuropsych evaluation. And unfortunately, in this study also, no test scores were reported, but the authors uh, re did report abnormalities most commonly in the areas of verbal fluency, working memory, sustained con concentration, and then complex uh, auditory processing. So um, there is some uh, convergence of uh, evidence uh, growing that seems to be suggesting this working memory, 
attention concentration uh, difficulty, kind of slowed processing. Um, all of these uh, cases reported emotional distress, and seven of them reported clinically significant uh, levels of depression and anxiety as well. So of course, the needs moving forward include the need for larger samples and control groups. And I put an S on control groups uh, very importantly, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, these require very careful uh, clinical characterization, really comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation using sensitive tools, and we need to see what these patterns look like uh, from these, these individuals. So we need actual test scores uh, to be reported uh, and so that studies can be replicated and, and built upon as this literature grows. Also, the use of longitudinal measurements would be very, very helpful. In addition to, of course, looking at biomarkers and genetic factors. From a research perspective, we need to develop models and apply sophisticated statistical analyses of these complex biosocial syndromes that we're looking at and talking about. Uh, we also really need to look for interaction effects and control for factors and symptoms in some of the models. For example, as Dr. LeCritz mentioned, if someone has a problem on testing with uh, their attention concentration, they also, and they also have a sleep disturbance, they also may have high levels of anxiety, we need to begin to statistically as well as clinically ferret out what is related to what because sleep disturbance can cause difficulties with attention. Uh, so can some of the, the reasons for referral. So in this case, a suspected exposure to these uh, uh, unnatural uh, radio frequency waves or um, uh, the other hypothesized mechanisms in this condition. But in cases of concussion also, we have to tease out what might be related to the concussion versus what may be related to some of the other current uh, symptoms. It's also important for us to carefully assess and analyze reported symptoms versus objective test results. Uh, they don't always match, as Dr. Lukritz mentioned. Um, sometimes patients will feel they're severely impaired in, in an area, and the testing results will, will reflect really more of a mild impairment. In those cases, that, that's probably reflecting the patient's feeling about how their difficulties are actually impacting their daily functioning, which, which is a different issue from a, from a real purely psychometric standpoint. But we need to put all this information together to draw good profiles uh, of these participants and, and patients. We need to carefully explore and develop phenotypes and examine the subgroups. So we have learned through many studies of, of many, many other conditions that uh, if you take uh, a large sample of a, any particular clinical group, there are going to be subgroups that demonstrate these types of symptoms versus those types of symptoms. And we need to begin to figure out uh, who's who how best to do that, and then how best to treat them, how best to treat them as well. I mentioned earlier the control groups. We really ought to be comparing these individuals who've experienced uh, these phenomena with other concussion, migraine, PPPD, other carefully selected clinical groups. And then of course, translational research and non-human models need to be developed as well. So in a, as a brief summary, uh, patient reports and symptom surveys and even the early neuropsych findings are suggestive of cognitive abnormalities in a subgroup of these individuals. The key question, as with lingering concussion symptoms, is who's at risk for persistent symptoms and why? And this is a big challenge to all of the fields involved in this line of research. I, I'm going to mention uh, one study we're doing in, in children and adolescent concussion uh, that we're collaborating with UCLA and some other sites across the country to look at these kids that take longer than usual to recover. And we're looking at autonomic measures. We're looking at brain imaging. We're looking at uh, blood-based biomarkers. We're looking at neuropsychological assessment. So we hope to be able to begin to help identify individuals early on after an event, if you will, uh, to where we develop a risk profile for them, as well as part of their treatment plan uh, to move them forward and hopefully uh, and still good recoveries and optimized recoveries in, in these individuals. Um, on that, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. I will stop sharing the screen. And hey, Dr. Dr. Clay, do you see any good questions for us? 
Yeah, I see several questions. I can see y'all. Thank you all for wonderful presentations. We have a question from Dr. Steve Young. He's a psychiatrist and colleague of mine. Welcome, Dr. Young. He asks, if, do you know if the, stu the NIH studies will be blinded or not? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I would hope so and assume so, um, but I, I'm really not sure. That, that is a great question and a very important methodological uh, concern for any of these type of investigations. That's a, that's a terrific point. And uh, Dr. Len Baer asks a question, uh, given that the, that the current, one of the current hypotheses behind Havana syndrome is uh, directed pulse radio frequency energy. If that's the case, would you or Dr. Lakritz classify that as a form of brain injury? I don't think we know enough about it yet, quite honestly. Um, I think we do need more uh, animal studies. Some of the data have been suggestive in that direction, but Dr. Lakritz, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, that's what I was gonna say. We don't really know. Um, but what we do know is that there are a lot of external factors or, or, or things that can happen to the body um, that can produce cognitive symptoms. And it actually may not be specifically a brain injury, uh, but something that's interfering uh, with the brains or the body's ability to, to use their, you know, to maximize what their abilities are. And I'll take just, there have been a number of um, comments about vision difficulties and any type of sensory disturbance, whether it is um, sound, whether it's vision, um, you know, hearing, what have you, um, has the potential to impact, you know, one's ability to, to attend, process, and get all the information in we need to kind of be our, our fully functioning self. We have another question from Christian Hagenmuller, uh, thanking you for a great talk, asking if HRV uh, could be a real-time biomarker and if sleep tracking is useful in terms of long-term prognosis. Both uh, excellent suggestions. We are using those techniques, uh, heart rate variability to evaluate after concussion in our uh, adolescent concussion recovery study. Uh, and we're actually looking at sleep monitoring as well because we do think those factors are important. And I, I think those should be definitely looked at uh, in the uh, Havana syndrome cases as well. 